Fall 2019 Paul C. Wilt Phi Kappa Phi Lecture. For those of you who are new to this format, it, there's nothing like it at Westmont because it consists of a lecture that lasts between 40 and 45 minutes by a Westmont faculty member, and then two criticisms of the lecture, also by Westmont faculty members. Now, criticism does not mean you disagree with it or you don't like it. It means you evaluate the talk. After that, there will be a general Q&A session, followed by refreshments out in the foyer there, or in the hall. I'd like to thank Aaron Sizer. Where are you, Aaron? for uh, organizing this event. Thank you. The lecture series, the Paul C. Welt Phi Kappa Phi Lectures, is named after Professor Emeritus Paul C. Welt of, of history. He was the glue that held this organization together for many years. In fact, out of his own pocket, he funded many of these talks by giving the honoraria to the speakers and respondents. I'm delighted to say that Paul is with us today. So Paul, if you could stand up. Giving Paul a ride to here is one of the founders of Phi Kappa Phi. In fact, his signature is number one on the charter that established this, and that's Professor Emeritus John Sider of our English department. I'm curious how many student members of Phi Kappa Phi are here? Could you raise your hand? All right, very good. Well, there are two that I want to call out. What the first is Chena Underhill, who is going to be introducing our main speaker. After that, the main speaker will come and give his talk. Afterwards, Charlotte Combrink will come and introduce the two respondents. So, Chena, thank you. All right. Good evening, everyone. So Dr. Van der Laan is a professor of philosophy at Westmont and has been teaching here since 2000, so almost 20 years now. That's exciting. Um, for his undergrad, Dr. Van der Laan attended Calvin College, where he earned degrees in mathematics and philosophy. He went on to earn his doctorate of philosophy from the University of Notre Dame with a dissertation titled Impossible Worlds. Dr. Van der Laan summarizes his research interests as falling into three main categories, ontology, metaphysical issues, and philosophical theology, in the borderland of metaphysics and logic. I will not try to explain those as there's a fair chance I would misconstrue many key elements. Mm -hmm. um, right now, Dr. Van der Laan is working on a book chapter about the distinction between the divine actions of creation, so that's causing the world to exist, and conservation, which is holding the world in existence. He is also a member of the Mellon Philosophy as a Way of Life Network, which describes itself as aiming to help people think more rigorously and deeply about the good life. One of Dr. Vanderlaan's hobbies is playing games. He also designs them. Most recently, his game Raft and Scuffer was released by ET Games, so that's pretty neat. If you're interested, you could find it online. Um, Dr. Vanderlaan has a wife, Karen, and two daughters. Miriam is five, and she's an avid singer and dancer. Salem is nine and likes to plan ahead. Um, Dr. Vanderlaan, we are looking forward to hearing what you have to say tonight. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, project I want to share with you tonight uh, is an exercise in faith-seeking understanding. Uh, and I think it's important for me to say that at the beginning, since from a certain angle it might look more like faith-seeking to create problems where none previously existed. <laughs> <laughs> but it is understanding what I'm after here. So I hold the Christian hope for the future, and reflection on the object of that hope raises a problem that I hope uh, I will be able to understand better. So in that way, the project is an Augustinian one. Mm -hmm. The problem concerns uh, the ultimate object of Christian hope, what Augustine playfully calls the end without end. My first task is to convince you that there really is a problem with the way many Christians have understood it. And then I'll explore a number of strategies for solving or avoiding the problem, uh, after which I'll reveal the strategy uh, that has the best prospects as I see it. And then finally, I'll mention a few implications of the discussion uh, for the way we go about hoping for things in the here and now. Much Christian thinking about the ultimate human end has followed broadly Aristotelian lines. A thing's ultimate end has been conceived as its highest attainable good. 
It's attainable, since only an attainable good is suitable as a goal. In the case of agents, the end must also be attainable uh, in order to motivate action. It's that for which a thing is done, as Aristotle puts it. The end must be the highest such good, since otherwise it wouldn't be the most choice-worthy good. If there were something better, then that thing would be the goal instead. But if a good is truly highest, then it would be superfluous to add other goods to it. An even more central feature of Christian thought is what the Apostles' Creed calls the life everlasting. <clears throat> Unending life is sometimes explicitly treated as an element or feature of the ultimate human end, as in the Westminster Larger Catechism's characterization of the chief and highest end of man as to glorify God and fully to enjoy him forever. Taken together, however, the ultimate human end and the life everlasting are paradoxical. Hereafter, let's use the word telos for the ultimate human end. Uh, suppose that the telos is a state that can be completed in a finite amount of time. For example, we might take the telos to be a vision of the divine essence, as Thomas Aquinas did. In this case, it seems that an ongoing vision of the divine essence would be better than an already completed state, which is to say that the completed state is not the highest attainable good after all. On the other hand, suppose the telos cannot be completed in a finite period. The goal is not merely to possess some good, but to possess it forever, say. And well, in that case, the telos will never be reached, and indeed can never be reached. No one is able to reach the end of an endless future. So the goal of doing something forever is unattainable. That's the problem in a nutshell. It looks then as if an everlasting being can't have a telos, but that conclusion will hardly seem acceptable to the Christian. If human beings are created by God, they're created with a purpose. There is something that they're aimed at. So we have a real puzzle. I'll call it the paradox of the end without end. We can make the argument uh, structure a little bit clearer by reframing it as follows. So first premise, each human being be is everlasting. The second premise, B has a telos T only if it's possible for B to attain T. You have to be able to get there if it's a goal. Third premise, B has a telos T only if T is greater than any other good that B can attain. Greatest attainable good. Fourth premise, if B is everlasting and B can attain T in a finite interval, then B can attain a good greater than T by continuing to exist by adding new goods on. Fifth premise, if B cannot attain T in a finite interval, then it's not possible for B to attain T. And the conclusion is that no human being has a telos. Okay? So an unattractive conclusion. <laughs> the argument assumes no particular view of what the telos is, whether one thinks of the ultimate human end as selfless adoration of God, thoroughly absorbing contemplation, a vocation of productive activity, or relationships of harmony with God and all creation. The premises of the argument are prima facie true, and the conclusion is prima facie false. So where does the argument go wrong? Uh, it's valid. There's nothing wrong with the structure of this argument. So if those premises are true, then the conclusion has to be. So if there is a problem here, well, really, we've only got two choices. Um, either there's something wrong with one of the premises, or we have to somehow make the conclusion uh, acceptable. So let's look at a few strategies here. What can we do? All right, strategy number one, denying the first premise. Uh, as a reminder, there's that first premise. Each human being B is everlasting. I am now putting on my objector hat. <laughs> premise one is false the scriptural promise is of eternal life but eternal can mean atemporal rather than everlasting after death human beings enter eternity and human life will be timeless this is consistent with attainment of the human telos which is to enter an atemporal relation with God okay. here's my reply that was the denial. Now the reply. Yeah. To be in a timeless state, 
is to lack temporal properties and relations. Being later than is a temporal relation. So no one in an atemporal state exists later than any temporal event. It follows that no human being existing at the present time will enter an atemporal state later on. Mm -hmm. okay? Our corollary is that it would be folly to hope for such a condition. Whatever else an atemporal state may be, it can't be something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. We may also note that the present strategy is an uneasy fit with traditional Christian thinking on the topic. Augustine and Boethius made the notion of an atemporal eternity um, a widespread feature of Christian thought, but they reserved the notion for God. Neither of them suggested that atemporality was a feature of human existence, future or otherwise. Uh, Aquinas does argue that the beatific vision is, he says, quote, a sort of participation in eternity, end quote. He argues, for example, on the grounds that what's seen in it is seen all at once, its object, the divine substance, is not in time, and its agent, the intellect, uh, is incorruptible. But none of those considerations keep him from drawing the conclusion that the felicity gained through this vision is perpetual, and from this it follows that it's temporal. In fact, Aquinas argues the felicity, quote, would not be the ultimate end unless it endured perpetually. Thus, Aquinas's case for human participation in eternity is not a denial of premise one. And likewise, I think, for other major figures of the Christian tradition. Now, perhaps some will be tempted to develop a non-traditional answer here on which there's a single unchanging moment that follows all of the times of one's fully temporal life. So not exactly atemporal, but sort of atemporal, something like that. To fully evaluate such a view, we need to see its motivating arguments, but already I think we can see at least one problem with it. Like any other static conception of the human end, this view would stand in prima facie tension with the Christian doctrine of resurrection. Christians anticipate an embodied afterlife, but it's difficult to see what a body could be for in an unchanging state. Let's proceed then on the assumption that humans will have an unending temporal existence. If that's correct, everlasting life has already begun. Mm -hmm. And thanks to my wife, Kate, for emphasizing uh, that point. Mm -hmm. One practical implication is that we ought not to defer our hopes until time is no more, since that will never happen. Okay. All of our hopes should be directed toward goods that can occur in time. So let's try another strategy, denying number two. Second premise again is this, that B has a telos only if it's possible for B to attain T. <laughs> it's not necessary to think that a telos must be attainable. It can play its role as that at which human life is aimed if it's approached asymptotically. That is, if human life comes and remains arbitrarily close to it. Closeness may be understood as similarity, so that the human state more and more resembles that of the telos, or as overlap, so that the human state comes to include more and more of the telos, like so. So there's your human state in blue getting closer and closer to this telos T over time, um, more and more it resembles it. Okay. My reply, treating the telos as unattainable would be a remarkable departure from the typical understanding. And in fact, it would be a departure from the notion of telos, that is a goal, that for which a thing is done, and replacing it with a guiding ideal, something that provides direction to a life without the possibility of a final arrival. <clears throat> in other words, the idea that human life asymptotically approaches an unattainable state is less a denial of premise two than an acceptance of the conclusion that humans have no telos, number six. Okay. Either way, the present strategy is a departure. But in any case, the strategy is dubious. It assumes that the ideal can't be attained in a finite interval, so the most salient type of candidate for telos is an everlasting state that is to say, loving, for example, loving and enjoying God forever. But if this sort of state is the ideal, it can't be approached asymptotically, or indeed to any meaningful extent. However long one lives, one is no closer to having lived forever. In an everlasting life, the ratio of the amount of time one has already lived to the amount of time one has yet to live is always exactly zero, if we confine ourselves to the real numbers. Or at any rate, less than every positive real number 
if we're willing to throw infinitesimals in there, okay? So one cannot be said to approach the purported, purported ideal asymptotically or otherwise. So the ideal, rather than being in a certain condition forever, must be a state that cannot be attained in a finite interval, but can be approached asymptotically. So what could that be? Well, a Zeno-esque state might have a suitable structure, but each interval there be a year. And then let there be a discontinuous interval it consists of a half year portion of one year and a quarter year portion of the next year and an eighth year portion of the next and a sixteenth of the next and a thirty second of that and so on. Right? So take those out to infinity and let D be that whole discontinuous interval. Put all those together. Okay. Well there's D. Now let's say that Z is the state of existing for a full year of interval D in total. All right, if approaching a state is overlapping or including more and more of it, then Z, existing for a full year of interval D, um, is something that can be approached uh, asymptotically. This suffices to show that there are states that can be approached in that way, um, but could this be the ideal of human life? The idea that it's Z or anything with a remotely similar structure uh, seems rather silly. Ridiculous, really. Sorry I brought it up. <laughs> All right. Here's a possibility that just isn't patently ridiculous. Um, maybe the ideal is uh, some, kind of, some kind of quality that can only be gained with diminishing returns, or rather the upper bound of some quality that can only be gained with diminishing returns. So for illustration, suppose one, that the ideal is perfect adoration of God, two, that the quality of one's adoration increases with experience, and that three, the extent of the gains inevitably decreases as the quality increases. And suppose further, for that four, the rate of decrease in the gains is such that perfect adoration cannot be reached in any finite amount of time, but one's adoration can come arbitrarily close to perfection. Then the ideal is asymptotically approachable. Okay? Is this the correct way to think about the human ideal? Well, there are some reasons to doubt it. Plausibly, or so it seems to me, the value of living as a human for a given length of time has some positive lower bound, some minimum, minimum value. So a day of human life can't be utterly without value, and human nature sets a kind of threshold below which its value cannot fall. But if so, the values that are added to a life as the days go on uh, do not become arbitrarily small. And so the total value of that life will eventually surpass any purported bound. At the least, we can see that some relatively specific theses about approaching the ideal would need to be established to show that the idea of asymptotic approach is viable. And as we've already seen, this approach doesn't really undermine premise two at all. So let's try another strategy. Premise three is that B has a telos only if it's greater than any other good that B can attain. Well, let's look to Aristotle. Aristotle doesn't treat the telos as the greatest attainable good. Admittedly, he does characterize happiness as self-sufficient, lacking nothing. But in a number of ways, his description of happiness makes it clear that it need not be the greatest possible good. For example, though Aristotle famously remarks that happiness is to be found in a complete life rather than a short span of time, he does not suggest that such a life must be the longest possible life. For another example, though great changes of fortune can tarnish one's happiness, even the happy person will experience some bad fortune. Since it's presumably possible that such bad fortune be avoided, the life that makes a person happy need not be the greatest possible. My reply. Well, granting the exegetical claims here, it remains puzzling how one could consistently affirm that the ultimate human end is not the greatest attainable good. And indeed, Aristotle's own thought provides some reasons to be puzzled about this. He says that if the complete good, that is the telos, were merely one good among others, then, quote, it would clearly be more worthy of choice with even the least good added to it. For the good added would cause an increase in goodness, and the greater good is always more worthy of choice, end quote. 
This appears to imply that the complete good cannot be improved upon, and that premise 3 is true. It may also be that Aristotle provides a solution to this puzzle. He repeatedly remarks that uh, it's inappropriate to seek more exactness than the subject matter allows. If one regards happiness as a lifetime of virtuous activity or a state that closely resembles this, then one could arguably affirm both the telos is more or less the greatest attainable good and that the state of one who attains the telos could have been improved. That suggests a way in which one might regard the telos as something less than the greatest attainable good. However, it does not provide a solution to the paradox. So suppose we identified the telos with some good that is surpassed by a similar good. In a rich and everlasting life, still longer lasting and more inclusive goods will surpass the candidate telos and every good that approximates it. For example, putting the virtues into action over a normal human lifespan of 70 or 80 years is a great and noteworthy good but putting the virtues into action over 70 or 80,000 years outshines it by a wide margin. So there's something that's significantly better. So what this shows is that even if premise three is false, we can repair it by, repair the argument by replacing premise three. There are a number of ways you could do this. Uh, here's one simple serviceable replacement. Three star. B has a telos T, only if no other good that B can attain is much greater than T. And if we do that, then to preserve the validity of the argument, we make the corresponding wording change in premise four. If B is everlasting and B can attain T in a finite interval, then B can attain a good much greater than T by living for a much longer period of time. Now, are these new premises true? Three star, I think, is a rather unassuming claim. If Aristotle's correct in saying that the greater good is always more choice worthy, then the telos, that for which human actions are ultimately done, can't be a decidedly lesser good, even if it can be less good than one that it approximates. Four star, I think, is also eminently plausible, provided that an everlasting individual can always continue to live a life of sufficient value. Christians, of course, believe that the life everlasting uh, is one of profound value. And also, it's plausible, as I suggested earlier, that additional states of given duration do add a value of at least a certain minimum. And in this case as well, adding enough of them will yield any additional amount of value that one cares to specify. So even if we allow that strictly the telos doesn't need to be the very highest attainable good, we don't have a way out of the paradox. Let's try again. All right. Again, premise four, if B is everlasting and B can attain T in a finite interval, then B can attain a good greater than T. Well, how should we think of this tell us? Maybe we should think of it as a state that requires at most a relatively brief interval. For example, rather than saying the tell us is the state of loving and enjoying God forever, we do better to say that it is the state of loving and enjoying God, period. And then add that the redeemed will be in this state forever. The telos is either a short-term state or maybe a general state that doesn't require any particular duration. And in fact, this way of thinking about the telos is rooted in the Aristotelian tradition. Aquinas, <coughs> for one, identifies the telos as the vision of the divine essence and he describes it as a vision that can be experienced at a particular time. So for example, in Aquinas, a separated soul can see the divine essence prior to the resurrection of the body. It doesn't need to be understood as an event that's spread over centuries or spread over an unending future. At a particular time, you can have that vision. Uh, but he also says the vision is the highest good and nothing can add to its goodness. And that would seem to make Premise four, false. I reply here that a short-term or general state can't be the best state. And furthermore, it's dubious that the telos is traditionally conceived as a short-term or general state. And we can see this uh, as follows. Those who have achieved a good for a short period of time ordinarily desire to keep that good or to acquire one that's better still. Better to be healthy for a lifetime than healthy for a year. 
Since those desires reflect judgments about what's good, well, it seems that we naturally regard the long-term possession of a good as better, all else being equal, than its short-term possession. And in general, the longer the better. So put in terms of states, longer good possession states, being healthy for a lifetime and the like, are better than the corresponding shorter states, such as being healthy for a year, from which it follows that no such shorter state is the best state. What about states that are general, not tied to any particular time frame? Being healthy, for example, is a more general state than both being healthy for a year and than being healthy for a lifetime. Anybody who's in the state of being healthy for a year is also in the state of being healthy, but not vice versa. Since it's possible to be in such a general state without being in the best state, well, then the general state is not itself the best state. And this part, too, I think, is confirmed by our ordinary judgments. Those who are healthy, if asked, would say that they want to continue being that way. In a rather literal sense, general states leave something to be desired, if only continued possession of a good already possessed. So both short-term states and general states can be uh, surpassed and thus are ill-suited to play the role of greatest attainable good. And that suffices to show that the present strategy for denying premise 4 fails. But there is an additional theological puzzle for Christians that may be drawn to this strategy. Put as a pointed question, if more isn't better, then why is more always provided? God gives life as an ongoing gift, but it'd be a strange gift that didn't leave the recipient better off. If at some, t some point one state were the best state, but not the final one, it keeps going, it would be followed by times that were oddly superfluous. As for the traditional conception of telos, the case that it's a short-term or general state is mixed at best. Aristotle famously concludes that the complete good is not, excuse me, the complete good is virtuous activity over a complete life, not simply virtuous activity. Though he may not assume that more is better without exception, he says clearly that a short time is not enough for happiness. Even Aquinas' way of thinking about the duration of the telos seems flexible. Here's the argument from Summa Contra Gentiles that I alluded to a little bit earlier. Aquinas says this. Again, the intellectual creature does not reach his ultimate end until his natural desire comes to rest. But just as one naturally desires felicity, so also does he naturally desire everlasting felicity. For since he is everlasting in his substance, he desires to possess forever that object which is desired for its own sake and not because of something else. Therefore, his felicity would not be the ultimate end unless it endured perpetually." End quote. The conclusion here gives us reason to think that, at this point at least, Aquinas identifies the telos with everlasting felicity and not with momentary felicity or felicity without qualification. So let's try again. Fifth premise. If B cannot attain T in a finite interval, then it's not possible for B to attain T. All right. Look, even though there will always be more time to come, there are at least two senses of attain that allow us to affirm that a goal of doing something forever is attainable. One is a tenseless sense of attain, and the other is what I will call an infinitary sense of attain. Right. The tenseless sense is most natural in two contexts, four-dimensionalism and atemporalism. Four-dimensionalism is a theory of time according to which future ex events exist just as fully as present events do and past events as well. From this perspective, we may say that a state is attained in a tenseless sense of the word if it belongs to the existing future or present or past. Atemporalism is a theory on which God has no temporal properties or relations, but temporal events are nonetheless present to God. From this perspective, a state is attained if it is present in its entirety to God, which is true provided that all that occurs at some time or other. So on the assumption of either four-dimensionalism or atemporalism, it's correct to say that it's possible for a person to attain an everlasting life. 
The infinitary sense uh, gives us a similar result with fewer metaphysical assumptions. To motivate the idea, uh, think of it this way. Consider the goal of remaining faithful to your spouse till death do you part. It's not possible to accomplish that goal at any time prior to the death that comes first. Okay. But it is possible to accomplish it with lifelong persistence. Now, suppose that you and your spouse will both live forever and that your goal is to be faithful forever. Again, it's not possible to accomplish this goal at any time in Medius race, but you may indeed continue to be faithful without fail, and in this sense, the goal is attainable. I reply. Well, four-dimensionalism and divine atemporality are debated theses, and many philosophers reject both of them. I, for one, okay? Mm -hmm. But even if we grant that there's an atemporal sense of attain, there remains the question whether it's possible that an end be attainable in this sense alone. Suppose there were a mountain of infinite height, and some intrepid mountaineer set out to climb all of it. He imagines the satisfaction that would come with accomplishing his lofty objective, the accolades of his peers. Can we allow that this is an attainable goal? Or is it rather like the illusory goal of those amateur mathematicians who set out to trisect an arbitrary <clears throat> angle using only a straight edge and compass? If the mountaineer's goal is to come to the end of an endless task, then the goal is ill-conceived. <coughs> Even if there is an atemporal God's eye view from which an endless task is, in a manner of speaking, completed, it's not clear that the attainment of this atemporal sort could properly motivate human action or ground hope, which is a future-oriented attitude. Any temporal being pursuing an endless task would have to acknowledge that the goal has not yet been reached and that this will always be so. In this respect, the case of the intrepid mountaineer resembles the myth of Sisyphus, the archetypal image of futility and pointlessness. What this indicates is that, an tenseless, that a tenseless sense of attain is of no use in escaping the paradox. The ordinary sense of attain, the one that's at work in the thought that an end must be attainable, makes the premises in which it appears true, and it's this sense that generates the paradox. The infinitary sense does no better. The case of the everlasting marriage suggests that someone attains a state in this special sense, provided that they will, future tense, meet certain conditions forever. And while the sense of attain would indeed make premise five false, it also appears to be kind of a misuse of the word. To attain a state in the sense is to have a certain kind of future, not a certain kind of present and past. In general, one who attains a state in the infinitary sense has not attained it in the standard sense. As with the tenseless sense, the infinitary sense does not express what we ordinarily mean by attain. More to the point, the availability of a non-standard sense does nothing to render the premises in which it occurs false when attain is used in the standard sense. So for this reason, the present objection to premise, objections to premise five are beside the point. It remains true that a state that cannot be reached in a finite amount of time is a state that cannot be reached. It's kind of discouraging. So all of the, <coughs> all of the premises seem to be true. So how about the conclusion? Are we forced to accept it? There's the conclusion again. Okay. And no hat this now, now, because we're just trying to defend it. Can we make this palatable? <clears throat> well, how about this? Though there is an august tradition of Christian thought that regards human life as aimed toward a highest attainable good, there's a noteworthy dissenting tradition as well. Gregory of Nyssa uses the word epitosis for the soul's ascent to God. Uh, and here, thanks to Samir Yadav for pointing me in the direction of Gregory of Nyssa, uh, which is a big help. I would have been without a solution. <laughs> Still would have been an interesting paper, though. <laughs> so um, according to Gregory, so the central theme of his account is that this ascent is perpetual progress. It's not final arrival or accomplishment. It is forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, as Paul puts it in Philippians 3.13. Gregory describes it as progress in love, growth toward the better, participation in the infinite good, and tireless desire for divine beauty. 
The process is brought about by the word's repeated call to the soul, which attracts it and gives it both the desire and the strength for the next stage of the ascent. Now, Gregory does not develop this account as a solution to the paradox of the end without end. He does not engage Aristotle's views directly or, as far as I can discern, discuss the notion of a telos at all. The foundation of this view is the infinite nature of God and the human capacity to bear the divine image through unlimited growth. But Epictetus does provide us a way of framing the rejection of a telos. There's no highest good for humans since each good is surpassed by another more inclusive good. Now, notice that it wouldn't work to say that the human telos is to continue growing in goodness forever. That answer would face the same problem as any other answer that identifies the telos as acting in some way forever. Such an end would be un unattainable, and a telos must be attainable. So it's not that. It's better to interpret epitosis as a rejection of the assumption that there is a human telos. On the other hand, it also just seems untenable to deny that outright. In the Christian story, a wise and provident God created humans. They're intended for something. How can that be? How can that be so without a target or a destination? It's natural to say of a roadside accretion of garbage, say, that it lacks a telos. It's an unintended byproduct, not something that was deliberately created for a purpose. Human life cannot be like that. All right. So, if this type of strategy is to be a satisfying one, we need some further explanation of how human life can lack a telos, but differ from the products of mere happenstance. Fortunately, I think there is more that can be said. We can add a little something to the notion of epictosis that will help to show that Christian hope is consistent with the conclusion that no human being has a telos. So at last, the proposed strategy. There's the conclusion again. And here's the idea. There is no single human telos that is the highest attainable good. Rather, there are an infinite number of human ends, each attainable, but none the highest. Like all attainable ends, each of them can be accomplished in a finite interval of time. Though it has no telos, human life is teleological. Let me read that again. Though it has no telos, human life is teleological. That seems like an important point. It's unlike a pile of garbage in that it has ends, and indeed has an infinite number of them. Not only that, but each end will be attained at some time, so on this view, life, everlasting life, is a life of fulfillment. Goals are constantly being met. In contrast, if the only end were infinitely distant, then everlasting life would be a life of deferment. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this is the primary conclusion of the paper. When it comes to thinking about the human future, the notion of a telos is the wrong conceptual tool for the job. We'll do better to replace the singular telos with an unlimited plurality of ends. Before we consider objections, notice first that the infinity of ends strategy must be employed with some care. If someone asks why God would create beings who were, by nature, directed toward an infinity of ends, we might say that God wanted creatures that would bear his own inexhaustible image, or that God wanted, excuse me, or that God wanted creatures to be the recipients of unending generosity. But as soon as the infinite array of ends is subsumed under some overarching goal, the solution to the paradox is lost. The overarching goal is the good that makes the other ends worthwhile. So it's the ultimate end. And since its fulfillment requires an eternity to complete, it's unattainable. So if this infinity of ends strategy is to succeed, we must carefully avoid saying that the many ends all serve a single overarching goal. And now we can see the first objection, namely that recognizing an overarching goal is inevitable. Perhaps one of the general answers to the question about God's reasons for creating humans is true. But in any case, we can consider the conjunctive end whose conjuncts are the infinity of attainable ends. All right? Suppose you've got all these ends, an infinite number of them. Well, consider their conjunction. E there is the conjunction of all those ends put together. That conjunctive end is, of course, a greater good than any of the conjuncts. If a person has each attainable end, then as a matter of logic, he or she has the conjunctive end too. 
I'm not using a hat, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm replying on behalf of myself, right? This is my reply. <laughs> the flaw in this objection is the final step. It does not follow that a person that has the that a person must have a conjunctive end, because the class of ends is not closed under conjunction. In general, having E1 as an end and having E2 as an end do not entail having E1 and E2 as an end, where E1 and E2 is a single conjunctive state. Okay. As an analogy, consider the logic of intentions. Suppose that one day Amy intends to wear a hat, and suppose that she also intends to visit New Jersey. It doesn't follow that Amy intends to wear a hat in New Jersey. Okay? If you asked her whether she preferred to wear a hat, that might be a matter of indifference to her. Right? It doesn't matter. She just happens to independently intend two different things. Uh, she might foresee the conjunction, but doesn't necessarily intend them. I suggest that ends are similar to intentions in this respect. In fact, in the case of intentions, it's really more than an analogy. From a theistic perspective, the ends of created things are goods that the creator intends for the created thing to have. Several goods can each be intended without their conjunction being intended. Like so. In the case of human ends, God has good reason to make the distinction and refrain from willing a conjunctive end. And the reason is by this time familiar. The conjunctive end is unattainable. So one who believes in an infinity of ends is not forced to recognize a single overarching end. This is so even if each of the finite number of ends has something in common, such as being an instance of divine generosity. In this case, it's true that God intends humans to be recipients of unending generosity, but it's not true that receiving unending generosity is the one goal at which each gift aims. Okay? Rather, the ends themselves are what God intends. Here's a second worry. The future outlined in the infinity of end strategy might seem inadequate in comparison with the traditional Aristotelian conception of an ultimate end that brings all desire to rest. On the infinity of end strategy, there will always be desires that are as yet unsatisfied. Shouldn't we prefer an understanding of human beatitude that entails perfect satisfaction rather than partial satisfaction? Well, of course, it's not what we would prefer, but of what the future actually holds. And we have reasons to think that the state that satisfies all desires at once is illusory, something like the desire of to have one's cake and eat it too. An everlasting person who is aware of at least some future goods and who desires some future goods, of which she is aware, will have some desires that are not yet satisfied. Partial satisfaction is not a substandard condition, but it's the natural condition of essentially temporal persons. In fact, the very beatitude of such a person will entail that they know and recognize many of the goods that are still to come. So everlasting persons should regard the satisfaction of all desires at once as incompatible with their beatitude. There will always be more to look forward to. And furthermore, a state in which some desires for the future are not yet met can be an immensely valuable one, both objectively and in the experience of its bearer. We see this to some degree in the current human condition, and we should expect to see it all the more when at last sorrow and sighing have fled. An ongoing life of increasing goods is compatible with the kinds of goods traditionally associated with the ultimate end. For example, knowledge and love and enjoyment of God as well as many others that have been claimed for human beatitude. Augustine, for example, mentions the activity of praise, the power of bodily movement, honor, freedom of the will, intellectual knowledge, and rest. Anselm adds beauty, swiftness, endurance of the body, health, quenching of hunger and thirst, melody, wisdom, friendship, concord, power, riches, security, and delight in the blessedness of loved ones and of God. All of these are compatible with a process of growth during which some desires are temporarily unfulfilled, not resulting in discontentment, but evoking a secure hope, an attitude of joyful anticipation. 
our focus here has been on the Christian's ultimate hope, and I've concluded that no hope is truly ultimate. There will always be more to anticipate. But I think the argument also suggests some more practical lessons for how we go about hoping for things in our day-to-day -day lives. There are a lot of things we could say here, but here are two of them. On its own, the infinity of ends strategy does not describe the ends of human life, nor does it specify to what degree the ends differ from each other. Still, I suggest that there are distinctively Christian reasons to hope for ends that are varied and an afterlife that is dynamic. <clears throat> Beatitude is not a static existence in which the ends are, say, seeing the divine essence for longer and longer periods of time. We can see one reason here in the narrative arc of scripture, which describes God's restoration of the broken world he loves. That world was made to be dynamic. Time and change are not products of the fall. And so we should expect that the restored world and our experience of it will continue to change over time, to develop and to grow and to bloom. Another reason to expect change is the doctrine of the resurrection. As suggested earlier, it's difficult to see why God would raise human bodies from death if they were not then meant to move. But there would be no reason for them to move if they would not thereby bring about some further good. For this reason, Aquinas, who identified the human telos with an unchanging beatific vision, apparently thought, or apparently thought at some times, that the resurrected bodies of the saints would perform no actions. On this view, resurrection bodies are like marble sculptures. Perhaps they're decorative, but whatever they're for, they aren't for doing anything. They scarcely seem like bodies at all. And this, I submit, is hard to believe. Oh, first, the practical corollary is that we ought to hope for variety and growth. And in particular, for movement and glorified bodies. Those of us who are ill should hope to run and jump to God's glory, not only to see. Like the future itself, our hoping should be varied and rich. Second lesson uh, is this. Just as the human future is diachronic, spread out over time, many of the ends that we hope for in this life are diachronic. I mean, not just the distant future, but the short term. Many of those ends are diachronic. We hope to be wise and loving parents to our children, to be kind and generous friends. We may hope to sample a range of the world's cuisines or to experience the thrill of surfing its most challenging waves. None of these are things that happen instantaneously. Still, when we consider one of those goods, we may be tempted to a kind of disappointment that we do not possess it all at once. I think that disappointment of this sort is misplaced because the hoped for goods are diachronic to desire to have them in their entirety at one time would be like the muddled desire of a music lover to fully appreciate, say, Vivaldi's Four Seasons in a single triumphant moment. <laughs> but music isn't that kind of thing. It has crescendos and chord resolutions and rhythms. By nature, it is spread across time. So however magnificent one's momentary experiences may be, nothing that happens at any one moment is a full experience of the four seasons. If we can learn to recognize the futility of the desire to have goods of this sort instantaneously, we can avoid one kind of irrational impatience and replace it with genuine hope for things whose goodness consists in part of their diachronic nature. And in this respect, music seems to me to be a pretty good me metaphor for the life to come. Something similar is true of hoping itself. The activity of hoping is diachronic, if only because we lack the bandwidth to focus on all of our future-oriented desires at once. So if one of the things you hope for is the virtue of hope, don't beat yourself up if some time goes by before you hope for something that you regard as good and important, like the flourishing of your loved ones or the second coming. Okay. A hopeful person will have a lively disposition to desire future goods, but since we're finite temporal creatures, our desires themselves will be occasional and seasonal. Some of them may benefit from being liturgical, but they will not be present to our minds without interruption. I suspect that the same can be said of the other virtues. 
Well, this paper does have an end, and we are now <laughs> arriving there. Okay? I hope that what we've seen is that the paradox of the end without end prompts us to reconsider what kind of future hope is available to naturally temporal creatures, those whose being is spread over time. Both at first glance and upon examination, the argument appears to show that there's no highest attainable good in an unending life. And so the notion of an ultimate end is problematic from a Christian perspective. Nonetheless, by positing an infinite number of ends, we can explain how Christian hope is consistent with a life of everlasting fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dr. Van Lelan. Dr. Van Lelan was introduced since he was a double major at Calvin in mathematics and philosophy by a data analytics major. Mm -hmm. It's only appropriate that our two respondents, one of whom is from religious studies, the other is from philosophy, be introduced by a religious studies major. That will be Charlotte Combrink. Each one has between five and eight minutes to respond. That is really a daunting task. I'm reminded of a quip attributed to Mark Twain, who in closing a very lengthy letter to a friend said, my apologies for writing such a short letter. <laughs> I'm sorry, my apologies for writing such a long letter. I didn't have time to write a short one. <laughs> Charlotte, if you come introduce our speakers. Our Good evening. Um, Thank you, Dr. Vanderlaan. I'm pleased to introduce both of our respondents tonight, um, uh, Stephen Zilstra and Telford Work. Um, Dr. Zilstra has been teaching at Westmont since tw uh, 2012. Um, he teaches courses including um, philosoph philosophical perspectives, medieval philosophy, and the biology department's seminar in bioethics. Um, last year, he received Westmont's um, adjunct teaching award. Dr. Zilstra is in high demand as he teaches as, at UCSB as well, where he teaches courses including animal ethics and metaphysics. Dr. Zilstra specializes in medieval and early modern metaphysics uh, with a unique focus in, on 17th century Dutch Jewish philosopher Baruch Spin Spinoza's work. In 2018, he received his PhD from the University of Toronto uh, with a dissertation titled Imminent causation in Spinoza and scholasticism. Before that, he received his MA um, in philosophy from the Institute of, for Christian Studies, and prior to that, his BA from Providence College um, with highest honors. He is currently involved in an international venture that is a forthcoming new annotated French, French translation of Spinoza's ethics. Dr. Zilstra is married to Dr. Sparkman, um, they have two sons, Henry and Benjamin, who are eight and one. I look forward to hearing from Dr. Zilstra tonight. Please join me in welcoming him. <laughs> Dr. Work, I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Work tonight. Dr. Work has been a professor of theology at Westmont since 2012. Um, he teaches a whole host of courses. He's taught um, courses including Intro to Christian Doctrine, a variety of uh, topical, theologi topical theology courses, um, and courses like Life and Literature in the New Testament. Um, Dr. Work received his BA from Stanford, his MA from Fuller Theological Seminary, and his PhD in Theology and Ethics from Duke University in 1999. Um, he's won uh, numerous awards, including um, the Westmont Faculty Research Award in 2008 and the Bruce and Adeline Baird Teacher of the Year Award um, in 2011. Dr. Work's books include Ain't Too Proud to Beg Living Through the Lord's Prayer and Living and Active Scripture in the Economy of Salvation. He has published articles um, some of which um, have been published in Oxford University Press, um, Erdman's books, and Theology Today, among, other, among others. Dr. Work volunteers his time at Montecito Covenant Church, um, and as a prison chaplain, he has four children, Jeremy, David, uh, sorry, Daniel, Junia, and Benjamin, um, and on the Westmont website, he says, um, that this is why he has no time for hobbies. He is the chair of the Religious Studies Department at Westmont and um, 
On his personal website, I learned that he's the fourth Telford work in his family line and that he has a vigorous sense of humor, so I highly recommend that you explore that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that generous introduction. Um, I'm Steven Zellstra, in case you're wondering. <laughs> uh, let me get my timer here. Okay. Uh, the new atheist philosopher, Daniel Dennett, once proposed the following test uh, to tell the difference, he thought, between a philosopher and a scientist. You would ask the person, would you rather to have discovered a solution to a long-standing problem such that after you, no one would ever bother talking about it again? Mm -hmm. Or would you rather to have discovered a new, a new problem that everyone after you can't stop talking about and would like to solve but can't? Mm -hmm. Uh, his hypothesis was that scientists would prefer the former and philosophers would prefer the latter and that that would tell us something interesting about the difference. Um, I'm not sure if that's true, but if it is, I predict that David Vanderlaan is going to make a lot of philosophers jealous. <laughs> his paradox of the end without end has all the marks of a genuine philosophical problem that's here to stay. It feels instantly familiar when you hear it, as if it were only lying in wait for someone to have discovered it. And though it may strike you initially as just a toy puzzle, the more you think about it, the deeper the puzzle seems. It's both really important, in this case for our understanding of human flourishing and our hope for the future, and really difficult, intractable maybe, as you begin to realize that all the possible solutions, such as uh, Professor Van der has laid out, have significant downsides, something has to give. We thought we could talk about human beings having a telos, which is attained in the hereafter, and now we're left with the following options. Humans have a telos, but they can never attain it, they can only approximate it. Or the telos can be attained, but then it's not the best possible state for us to be in. What? Or. <laughs> Uh, it, there's no point in having an everlasting life. What? Um, or human beings will not uh, be given an everlasting life at all, but will be stuck in an atemporal now. Or lastly, humans don't have a telos at all. Remarkably, it's this last option which David endorses and develops in his paper, striking out on a path which is radical in both senses of the term. On the one hand, there's a bracing iconoclasm to it, insofar as it departs from the mainstream ways of thinking about human fulfillment in Western uh, theology, in its form as it is by the Aristotelian account of the highest good. And on the other hand, in the other way of thinking about the term radical, it gets to the roots of things, bringing out features of human finitude, the resurrection, temporality, and the kinds of goods we can enjoy which may have been occluded by that Aristotelian framework many Christians have taken for granted, but which remains crucial to the Christian faith nonetheless. Um, now, I want to talk about um, a few things that, uh, 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 a few ways in which I think that um, this solution that Professor van der Laan has given us uh, may, you know, have some objections, further objections that can be raised. I just want to make two quick points before I do that. Um, it, it, both of them kind of on the same topic, which is that I think there are ways in which his uh, infinity of ends paradox, or sorry, his end without end paradox has wider consequences. And I'll just kind of briefly flag these. F the first thing I want to note is that as far as I can tell, the paradox itself spells trouble for Pascal's wager at least in its canonical form, because normally that wager is presented as making the case that in the absence of proof, you should bet on God's existence because, why? The potential payoff is infinitely greater uh, than what you would get if you took the opposite bet and won, right? 
But hang on, after the paradox of the end without end, you might ask, when does one actually attain this eternal uh, eternity of life and happiness? When do I get to cash out on my winnings? <laughs> Never. <laughs> um, so uh, it seems like we're going to have to reformulate the wager in such a way that we're stuck with a finite value, versus uh, maybe a really big one, versus a finite value. And that changes the decision matrix significantly, putting probability back on the table. That's the crucial thing. Um, and then the other thing is that it strikes me that the paradox can be reformulated in a way that does not rely on the premise that human beings are everlasting creatures. Um, I get why, why David wants to have that premise in there so we can talk about atemporality, but it seems like there's probably a more general form of the paradox that applies to just uh, sort of more secular versions of the telos like you find in Aristotle. Because it seems like all you really need for the paradox to get going is the idea that for any finite amount of time enjoying a good, it would be better to have a little bit more. And as soon as you accept that, you have a problem. And it seems like someone like Aristotle has to accept that. Okay. Um, now, despite all these things, so I, I really enjoyed uh, the, the uh, infinity of n's uh, solution or, or acceptance of the conclusion, making it more palatable, um, especially because it is sensitive to what I take to be the, the sort of traditional teleological traditions sense that human life has to be goal-directed. As Professor van der Laan says, uh, you know, how can human life be purposeful without a target or destination, it's not like a roadside accretion of garbage, right? It's got to be created for a purpose. Um, and so uh, I want to close by, uh, you know, my last bit of comments will be on whether he sufficiently captures that sense of uh, the goal-directedness of human behavior. My worry is that it doesn't. Um, and so I'm going to sort of speak I don't have a special hat, but I'm going to speak like I'm Thomas Aquinas or Aristotle or something like this for the rest of my comments. Um, so the starting point of Aristotle's account of the human telos in the Nicomachean Ethics, Book 1, is that human endeavors are inherently goal-directed. We do things for the sake of attaining certain, go attaining certain goods, whether these goods are states or things or what have you. And then he notes that some things are sought for their own sake, and some are sought for the sake of other things, and some both. And so then if Aristotle makes the claim that if human beings have a telos, an um, ultimate end, it has to be the ultimate or highest of goods, which means that it has to be sought for its own sake, not for the sake of other things, and that other things are sought for its sake. He then argues that there must be such a good, the highest one, for otherwise all our desires and endeavors would be, quote, empty and futile because we would keep on doing one thing for the sake of another, for the sake of another, for the sake of another, unto infinity. He then quickly decides that the highest good is called eudaimonia, sometimes translated as happiness, but better translated as fulfillment. Um, and uh, what, what I find interesting about this is that from the sort of teleological tradition after Aristotle, both including Christians and other Hellenistic schools like Stoicism and Epicureanism, all of this stuff is perfectly uncontroversial. They take this to be a basic fact of human psychology that we seek things in this way. So in other words, if you keep asking why you do what you do, eventually you will ground out saying, because I want to be fulfilled or happy, right? And so I think uh, someone from this point of view would say, like, it's, this, is not, this is a basic feature of human psychology. What's controversial is how you fill in what that highest state looks like, what it consists in. Is it a life of virtue? Is it a life of virtue plus some other stuff? Is it a life of wealth? Is it a life of a good reputation? But the fact that we all do seek happiness is supposed to be basic. Um, so... Uh, um, this is maybe another way of phrasing this um, objection that uh, Professor Van der Laan has given, right? Um, it seems inevitable from the inside, right? A, a lot of the characteristics that have been given are kind of exterior characteristics of what this good looks like. But as a matter of human intentions, 
is it not the case that we do seek a fulfilled life and therefore regardless or not of whether that fulfilled life consists in, in, in infinity of ends, is it not the case that we have a highest one um, and we, we're back in the paradox? Okay, so I'm out of time, so I've got to end there, but uh, thank you very much. Well, it's an honor to be here, and I'm grateful for the invitation of David. I appreciate uh, his thesis and the arguments by which he supports that thesis. Not being an analytic philosopher or analytic theologian, I'm less qualified to critique the logic, um, though I'll eventually make one amateurish attempt to move in that direction. I'd rather spend most of my time to offer some further thoughts about an infinity of ends from my discipline's perspective. Number one, the triad of faith, hope, and love, the so-called theological virtues, that triad occur occurs across the New Testament, but its most influential treatment is in 1 Corinthians 13. You've probably heard it mm -hmm. at weddings, actually. <laughs> there, Paul contrasts things that pass away, knowledge, prophecies, tongues, with those three that remain. These three remain, he says. Augustine couldn't see how faith in what's unseen and hope for what's to come could remain. After all, we no longer, you know, it's no longer unseen and it's been fulfilled. So Augustine was influential in subsequent tradition for treating love as the one thing that truly remains. This revision of Paul has always struck me as odd. David's proposal is one way of rescuing Paul from Augustine by questioning the unspoken assumption of a singular and simply fulfilled tell us. We can keep trusting and hoping all things. As later in the chapter, love believes all things or trusts all things. Love hopes all things. That actually works. Um, we can keep doing that in love because there's always more to trust in and more to hope for. Whether or not I find an infinity of ends fully satisfying, the proposal improves on the usual schema that can't quite fit Paul's eschatology. Number two, Jesus' parables in the Synoptic Gospels of the return of the Son of Man are scenes not of a retirement party where it's all over, nor a vision of either limited or unlimited duration, but of a promotion where greater work lies ahead. You've been faithful with a little. I will set you over much. The language of an infinity of ends honors this eschatological intensification in which the temporal work we've done in this life is a fitting preparation and anticipation and test for the greater work to come. Number three, David's proposal resonates rather well with the Bible's habit of not yielding closure whenever God just uh, does just about anything. You know, uh, Gerhard von Rott, Old Testament scholar, noticed that every fulfillment in the Old Testament seems partial, opening up further hope in further work. He took this as an anticipation of the New Testament's fulfillment, which, of course, it is. There's always more, as you said. Sure, plenty terminates in the, in the New Testament, right? The old has passed away. Christ is the terminus of the old covenant of Moses. Genealogies stop mattering after Jesus inherits their promises, and so on. But why assume that the old pattern's future orientation is one of those terminations? Why wouldn't God's eternity always pull temporal creation forward in further anticipation, as well as backward in ever richer remembrance. Mm -hmm. David's work suggests a neat refiguring of the classic Christian motif of promise fulfillment. <coughs> fulfillment doesn't mean closure. Um, number four, this jibes nicely with another theological theme, sanctification. Augustine describes our moral progress as a move from being first at first, able to sin, that's in the garden, 
Two, in the fall and after the fall, not being able not to sin. Two, in redemption, becoming able not to sin, although too slowly in my case. (laughs) Two, in glorification, not even being able to sin. So, what does it mean not to be able to fail or miss the mark ever again? It means to keep on succeeding, right? Mm. An infinity of ends is totally compatible with human sanctification and glorification. They inform each other fruitfully, in fact. Okay, I could go on saying nice things, but this is an academic event. (laughs) I do want to issue a possible critique in the form of a standard warning for my discipline. Many of our disciplines, including my own, incredibly, are in the habit of beginning with generalized phenomena and then projecting them onto infinity or eternity, perfection, God, and so on. Martin Luther calls this habit an idolatrous theology of glory. We take human notions of glory and we ascribe them to God or God's stuff. And he says any truly Christian theology centers on Jesus, who after all is where God becomes interpretable for us. And when we interpret God through Christ, particularly the cross, we find our assumptions radically questioned, overturned, judged, and remade. So where human purpose is concerned, is it really appropriate to apply apply human tele, tele is the plural of tele, Mm -hmm. so straightforwardly to eternity? Should we really start with Aristotle's observations on human purpose? Or does Christ revolutionize human ends in ways that limit the applicability of that syllogism, however valid it might be in ordinary circumstances? Here's what I mean. Human tele are ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the incarnate second person of the Trinity. Your tele and mine are properly ordered only as they are included in his share of the triune God's eternal life then isn't it a theology of glory to start instead with a generalized account of human purpose? Wouldn't it be another better strategy to solve this this problem that David identified, to start with Christ's tele, or telos, or whatever you would call it, and work from there? And I think this this is permissible. After all, in Christ are both divine nature and human nature. So human purpose is a thing where Jesus is concerned. His person is actually where human tele and divine tele coincide perfectly. Putting Christ front and center might demand that we rethink what a human telos might be, even perhaps uh, in terms of attainability, ultimacy, and so on. If in Christ, humanity would indeed, or will indeed, grow in goodness forever, Despite that conflicting with the standard definition of telos, well, then so much the worse for standard teleology. It's the wrong conceptual tool. There might be a different reason, then, why, as David claims, the notion of a telos is the wrong conceptual tool for the job of thinking about the human future. Um, The church is, Paul in Ephesians, the fullness of Christ who fills all in all. And Christ fills all in all from far above all authorities and powers and purposes of ours. So in Christ, human tele uh, are both far different from humanity's own construals of our tele and determinative. His are determinative for those human ends that last. When I go with Christ in mind, to David's five premises, I wonder about, for instance, premise five. Consider God being all in all through Christ's subjection in 1 Corinthians 15, 28. That's a weird verse, by the way. Mm -hmm. Christ will be subjected after everything's been subjected to Christ so that God will be all in all. Um, Consider that as a general state or or as 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 an unending state, I should say. It seems to to express, in a final form, creation's rightful place and permanent place in the mutual, eternal, perfect love of Father and Son in the Spirit. God and creation have attained a certain kind of future. 
regardless of the conventions behind premises two and five. Like an eternity of necessary faithfulness, not being able to sin, right? So assured, but not surpassed without the need for an infinity of ends. I suspect that starting heuristically with this kind of state, rather than general human health or even humans enjoying beatific vision, as an Aristotelian or a Thomist would, might refute the premises or at least reframe them or the whole syllogism in a more naturally Christian way. I don't have the analytic chops to do this or even to test my suspicion. So all I can offer is the suggestion and the offer to be part of an interdisciplinary dialogue along those lines, which I'd like to do. A last word of appreciation to conclude. In Ephesians, Paul prays that we may receive a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in his knowledge, enlightened to know what is the hope, his glorious inheritance in the saints. I'm truly grateful that David's work has opened some doors in that direction that I would never have thought to open myself. It exemplifies the love of wisdom for which his discipline is named. Thank you. So at this stage, I'm going to invite Professor Vandalon to come up and respond briefly to his two respondents and then field questions from the audience. The one rule that we have for questions from the audience is that the first one must be from a student. Oh, Stephen Telford, thank you so much. Really appreciate um, all those comments. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for those. Um, I'll try to be brief here. So um, have I undermined Pascal's wager inadvertently? I'd sort of like Pascal's wager to work. Um, <laughs> at gut level, seems seems like he's on to something there, although I'm not super committed to the particular form of his argument. There are a lot of interesting questions to raise, I mean, precisely to do with the notion of infinity there, right? Um, you know, I think my initial gut reaction is to say, yeah, let's try to run it with finite quantities and see what happens. Now, um, uh, Dr. Zilstra has pointed out, okay, now probability is a factor, right? How, how likely is the scenario of God's existence? That now becomes a bigger issue. Um, but still, I can give you any finite quantity you want, right? <laughs> as long as it's not infinite, I can give it to you. So that seems promising uh, to me. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that Aristotle wouldn't like the paper, right? Um, <laughs> I, I take that seriously. So do we, do we not seek eudaimonia as the one end? I'm not totally sure what to say about that. Um, I think what I, what I will say is just that I'm not sure that the argument that Aristotle gives there up front in the ethics clearly secures uh, the conclusion that there is a single thing at which all things aim, right? I'm not sure what to say about the psychological claim, but you, know, you and I, maybe we're all pursuing one thing, but um, whether there is that single good, um, there have got to be some things that are good for their own sake and not for the sake of something else, um, but why not a lot of those? And at least that's one of those things I don't see clearly yet. Um, but again, as I said, I'm seeking understanding here, and so that might be a fruitful area for some continued thought uh, on my part. Uh, Telford's context or con comments, excuse me. I'm thankful for the for the biblical context there, especially. Some of you may have noticed there was precious little of that in the paper itself, right? Sort of saying what the scriptures have to say about this. Um, but even so, um, one of the things I am really hoping to do with the paper is loosen our grip on one traditional conception of the ultimate end in such a way that we are better able to attend to the biblical witness here, right? So I'm really grateful for you starting to sketch that out. Um, and I'm really thrilled with the idea that I am perhaps rescuing Paul from Augustine here. <laughs> um, <laughs> hurrah. <laughs> that's really cool. As for, the, uh, as for the warning, you know, that's well taken. Um, 
And I think in some ways the paper is trying to do that, right? I'm trying to, again, just loosen the grip on one conceptual scheme. Now maybe mine has its own problems, and I think I just take a wait and see attitude to that, toward that. Let's see what the problems are if they come up. In some ways the project began as a worry. I think about the kind of thing that you were worried about. Um, there were some there was a paper that I heard some years ago. Well, I won't get into that. Let me just say that I think a lot of philosophers um, end up treating the conception of the human end or the afterlife sort of in the way they treat the concept of God. And so where God is the greatest possible being, heaven is that state then which no greater can be conceived. right? And I do think there's a kind of danger there. Um, what should we call it? A kind of uh, urinolatry? Would that be the right word? A kind of idolatry oh. of heaven? Mm -hmm. um, sure. I think there's some of that floating around out there, and I'm resisting that. Mm -hmm. So in that way, I think we're sort of on the same, mm -hmm. sort of on the same page. Um, what happens if we take Christ front and center and approach the argument? Well, here too, I would just say I'd love to have further discussion about that. Um, I have one initial worry. Um, on the one hand, yes, Christ is central. And on the other hand, exceptional cases make bad law. And so when we start thinking about the human telos or purpose, it occurs to me that Christ is uncreated. And created things sort of need a purpose in the sense that God makes them for whatever reason God has, right? Brings them about for a purpose. But whatever we might say about Christ it seems to me is bound to be exceptional in some way. And so I really wonder, and it is just a wondering, how is this going to work? I'm not sure. Um, how about that state of God being all in all? I think, again, I want to sit down and look at the logic of the argument. Um, but my, again, my first reaction is just to say, well, let's just run it through the dilemma, right? Can that be attained in a finite amount of time? If yes, don't we want more of it? I mean, it's sort of hard to imagine at last that sort of fulfillment and not wanting it to go on, right? In which case then we've got a very general state, which is good, it's not, it's not deficient, but isn't there a more specific state that's going to be greater, something that yet we want to do? <coughs> in that position. So that's my, again, just off-the-cuff response uh, to that. Um, what other thoughts do you have? Students? Go ahead. So assume we can, as human beings, live like to our telos and pass that. Why can't there be a God-enabled state of being in which um, we can live past that and like greater good can be enabled, but there's nothing else potentially that we have to aim for, like that we were created for because we've already achieved that uh, potential to tell us. Like why does living on past that necessarily create a greater good to aim at? Why would it create a greater good if you were to go on living? Right, and why can't God say it's great because he's God and it's okay? Yeah. So, you've reached this goal. Your life continues. It continues to contain goods, we think, good things. Um, let me try and put it in the context of how somebody like Aristotle or Aquinas would think of it. I mean, so now you're continuing to act intentionally after this happens. So you've got goals in mind. Those goals are themselves good things. As we saw in that quotation from Aristotle, he thinks that, the, that any good, if you add the least bit to it, it gets better, right? So whatever that thing is that you reached, that was terrific, but how about that plus, right? Plus a latte, <laughs> right? Or whatever good you want to add, it's like, it's a little bit better. Right? So that's the puzzle anyway. Yeah. Um, if those are real goods, why would it not make the total experience better? It's not that it's even different necessarily than what came before, but even if it's just a matter of continuing to live for more time, 
you still have, it seems, a better state than what you had before, right? Beatific vision for one year is awesome, but for 10 years is better. Mm -hmm. And so that's the worry. It's not even um, that the content has to be different in order to make the total state a better one. Mm -hmm. Did that address the question? Yeah. Okay, great. Others? Um, over there, James. Um, do you like, still maintain time within your kind of proposed strategy? Is that still part of what we're moving? Towards? Yeah, yeah. In fact, that's what creates the problem in a way, right? So I am, I'm assuming um, the life everlasting, by which I mean that there's no end to the time. Okay. Um, so the time keeps going. Now, if that weren't true, then you really wouldn't generate this puddle, right? Because the, the problem is that if time goes on, it seems like a good life is going to accumulate more goods in it. Mm -hmm. right? So I'm taking, I'm taking the Apostles' Creed kind of literally there, right? life everlasting, and I'm also interpreting scripture in a certain way. So this talk of eternal life, I take to be life in time that never ends. Um, now there is an interpretive question there. Um, I think the many, many Christians who have... Mm -hmm. Uh, talked about divine atemporality um, are interpreting the word eternal in one way. Okay? I think generally speaking the scriptures are written in an ordinary language that isn't shaped by the Platonic tradition in the way that later Christian theology is. Okay? So I don't take the scriptures to be saying oh you're going to enter into some kind of timeless state. Okay? Um, and if you think that that's true I'd I'd be really curious to sort of why you think that's true. Do you think the scriptures are saying that? Definitely Christian tradition says that quite a lot. Okay? And you've all heard it from the pul pulpit, I assume. You know, there are people, I remember a pastor of mine once uh, giving a sermon uh, and saying, you know, do you want to know what eternity is like? Well, just imagine the best moment of your life frozen. <laughs> Sounds terrible. <laughs> yeah, like awful. <laughs> right? So, it sounds awful, but my main point is that it doesn't sound biblical to me either. I don't, I don't see that concept there. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, um, uh, could you, I guess, just clarify again how your infinity events is different from the epic tosses? Sure, it's uh, subtle. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing there, I'm basically agreeing with Gregory. Um, the only difference is that he doesn't say anything about ends. Mm -hmm. So this, or tell us. He doesn't really bring that notion up. So I'm interpreting him as denying a tell us, and then asking the question, is human life then pointless? It's the sort of thing that has no goal, no directedness to it, and then just sort of filling in the blank. No, that's not it. It's got an infinite number. So really, I'm adopting his solution gotcha. and connecting it to the problem. That's all I'm doing. You can give him most of the credit. <laughs> yeah. Paul. Samir. Oh. Yeah, yeah, Samir. Um, so I obviously really love this view because I'm <laughs> a big fan of Gregory Dissus. Yeah. Um, and I would just uh, say that um, he actually does talk about ends. Okay. Um, right. In the commentary on the, on the, the his homilies on the song of Solomon, and um, and I, so that's just to say, yay, his view is your view. Okay. Um, he just doesn't have a Thomist sort of tradition and the Augustinian tradition to be arguing against. Um, mm. But he does have a similar argument to your argument in response to originism over the question of satisfaction. Okay. Because origin takes the tradition and uh, to require in much the way that um, uh, Dr. Zilstra was talking about uh, to re to require you know eudaimonistic conception of fulfillment and satisfaction um, that that Gregory denies from his teacher from origin. So okay. um, so but the the thing that I think is really uh, really interesting about your view is that it actually gives. Um, People who, you know, take the minority report, the, the Gregory's view, to actually have an argument against the Thomistic alternative uh. that that isn't very much explored in tradition. Yeah. So I think okay. it's, a, it's a fantastic development of that. Right. I would have loved the paper. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samir. Well, more research for me then. Um, yeah. So and I. The interesting thing too about the Christological point that Dr. Work talked about is that um, in the commentary on the on the song. 
Um, he actually sets this up precisely in an allegorical conception of the bride and the bridegroom, where the bridegroom is Christ. Um, and so he takes our infinity of ends to be a, a kind of following after the kind of um, mutability of, uh, of, of the incarnate Christ. Um, so, um, anyway. Yeah, 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 that's terrific. I'll need to get those references later. Thank you. We always close the evening, the formal part, at 8.30. But you're welcome to stick around, talk to Dr. Vanderlaan, come out, out into the hall and get some goodies, talk with each other. But let's thank all our speakers one more time. Mm -hmm.